It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Hello, good morning. And the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hey, how's everybody in these good. troubled times? Yeah, well, we're all locked down. We're all locked down, but that doesn't prevent us from presenting the show. And we've got a great show for you. Of course, what's on everybody's mind is the coronavirus pandemic. And this COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare many of the weaknesses of our healthcare system, including the health and safety of the healthcare workers themselves, the people we depend on who are at high risk during this crisis. And despite the high risk, they are not being provided necessary protections. In fact, a headline in Fortune magazine this week stated that some hospitals are telling healthcare workers they will be fired for reporting a lack of protective gear. Protective masks are usually used once and thrown away, but now faced with a very contagious virus, hospitals are telling doctors and nurses to clean and reuse their masks. Some nurses report self-quarantining after being exposed to COVID-19, but then being told to return to work before their two-week quarantine is up. Our first guest will be Jean Ross, who is president of the largest union of nurses in the United States, National Nurses United, and she is here to tell us about her efforts to help nurses stay safe during this pandemic. And that's just the first half of the show. In the second half, Donald Trump says he'd like to have the country reopen and back to normal by May 1st. When asked what he would rely on for that final answer, he pointed to his head. Uh-oh, not a good sign. In the second half of the show, we welcome back Dr. Bandy Lee, who has been sounding the alarm about the mental health of this president and his judgment since she first appeared on our program back in 2017 to talk about the book she edited, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Health Professionals Assess a President. Last time Dr. Lee was here, just around the first of the year, she said Donald Trump thinks he's the quote unquote king of everything. And just this week at one of his press conferences, he maintained that he had absolute power to reopen the country economically. Dr. Lee will tell us about why he is especially unfit to lead during this crisis. And as always, we'll find some time in between to take a short break and check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. And if we have some time left over, we'll try to tackle a listener question. But let's start by talking about what needs to happen to protect nurses. David? Jean Ross is an acute care nurse and the president of National Nurses United. It's the largest union of registered nurses in the United States. National Nurses United aims to create a vision of collective action for nurses so that nurses are able to have more influence over the healthcare industry and a larger voice in public policy. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Jean Ross. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, indeed. Welcome. I want to read one of the demands of the nurses just to illustrate how minimally they are in terms of the safety and health of workers in this area, and also to show just how ill-prepared we were as a society. And I'm not just talking about the careening captain of the ship, the self-absorbed Donald Trump, who contradicts himself and overrules scientific advice and plays quack doctor, but we were unprepared because our public budgets are completely screwed up going to massive, redundant military budgets and at the expense of domestic necessities, which include saving lives, preventing injuries, and preventing diseases. And that fell all over the institutions that weren't ready, even CDC wasn't ready and fumbled. So here's the demand, and I'm quoting, employers shall provide the highest level of protection, including functioning negative pressure rooms and personal protective equipment for nurses providing care to possible and confirmed COVID-19 cases. Employers must ensure negative pressure rooms remain functional at all times during use. Highest level of personal protective equipment must include Coveralls meeting ASTM standards, gloves, temporary scrubs, and other protections, end quote. Now, here we have hospital structures, many of them giant hospital chains, with hugely overpaid CEOs, millions of dollars a year, some of them, as the California Nurses Association research pointed out years ago, and they weren't prepared. So what can be done here, Gene Ross? 
to take it from the workplace, the front lines, all the way to Congress, all the way to the White House, because the ultimate responsibility here for public health is the President of the United States and the Congress. They have the money, they have the power, they do have to work with the states and localities, but we have to go to the top if we're going to change the system and the priorities. Tell us about this. Well, it's going to take, obviously, a whole lot of pressure. And we're hampered a bit now because of physical distancing. We're not out in the streets like we normally would be. So we've taken a number of ways of changing this. In addition to our public petitions, visual things we do, we have always lobbied Congress. And starting today and then in the next few days, we will be virtually meeting with senators from more than 20 states. We will be setting up appointments and asking for our two main asks, one of which you already mentioned, which is to urge Congress to mandate that the president use the Defense Production Act, not as he says, as a hammer, but to actually use it to mass produce and get us needed PPE, ventilators, and other medical equipment, and get it now, as we would say, stat. And then Also, to have OSHA do a temporary emergency infectious disease standard, and that would require that we get that optimal PPE that you mentioned for all frontline healthcare workers. So those are our two main asks. We've been on our nationalnursesunited.org site. We've had people take action. We have our website, protectnurses.org. The public has been very helpful in doing that. And we also have over 500 volunteers across the country to date. And we're texting every single nurse in the country. I don't think, well, I know we've never done anything like this before. I don't know that anyone else has. And we're offering a number of things, our online resources and information, because, you know, we in the public are not getting the correct information. We cannot trust that. And then there's links to join our weekly COVID-19 Facebook Live updates. There's a Facebook group for nurses. There's all kinds of information about our advocacy efforts, the lobbying that I mentioned earlier. And so we're doing this peer-to-peer texting software. We've gotten many, many volunteers, over 500, and we've reached over 750,000 nurses in 10 different states. So basically, if they're nurses, they can email us with a question at covid at nationalnursesunited.org. And there they can either use the information that we've got, email us, or they can, if they have a question, they can actually speak to someone on the phone from our union. Well, even before the COVID-19 crisis, nurses have been much more visible than doctors. They've been out on the streets, informative picketing. They connect with citizen groups and they lobby for their patients on specific patient-oriented legislation. So I want to ask you, Gene Ross, what are your counterpart medical associations doing here? The American Medical Association, the Association of Family Physicians, and all the others, what are they doing given the horrendous stories of unprotected healthcare workers, even when they get sick, they don't get adequately tested, adequately served, What are the doctors of the country doing here? Well, what I've observed is they are obviously as supportive as we are of getting the personal protective equipment because they're on the front lines with us, although I don't see them necessarily getting coverage or being asked those questions as we are when I see them on TV. I will say even for nurses, it depends on where you work, not just what state, not even which hospital or hospital system, but actually what unit you work on. And that's just a result, of course, of our fragmented patchwork system where you can't tell any employer what to do. I mean, even CDC guidelines are guidelines. And those, of course, get downgraded every time the hospital association puts in a word. So we're just keeping at trying to inform the public because the public has always been solidly behind us. You're right. Nurses are at the peak of public opinion support. But of course, doctors are on the front lines here. I was referring to the doctor organizations that have considerable influence over Congress and over the political system from Washington to state capitals. 
What do you think they should be doing that they're not doing? These are the doctor specialty associations, the American Medical Association, its state chapters. What do you think they should be doing along with what you're doing? Well, I think they should be supporting us. I think they should be doing exactly what we're doing, especially since very often, you know, we're a female-dominated profession, and sad to say, sometimes they listen to men, and the bulk of doctors still are more male. But, you know, when it comes to the kind of fighting that we do with our union, an organization and association is a lot different than a union. And there aren't very many doctors that are unionized. So whereas we can speak out freely without fear of losing our jobs, even during a pandemic, nurses are being threatened with being fired. They're not in the same position that we are. But absolutely, I would hope that they would be lobbying for the same type of things for themselves and for us, and of course, for the public health. Well, there's such heartbreaking stories where when patients get diagnosed with COVID-19, they have to be quarantined, they have to be isolated, sometimes from their own family. Oftentimes, if they're in nursing homes, families can only look through a glass window to try to communicate with them. What are the nurses doing about the kind of isolation, which, of course, leads to tremendous psychological damage, along with the tremendous pain that these people are going through? Mm -hmm. And the nurses know what the situation is. What are they proposing here? Well, you know, we do our best, obviously, whatever situation we're put in. With When those patients are in that situation where they can't have family with them, especially when they're going to die, The nurse becomes that family. We are the ones that sit there and hold hands and tell them, you know, we're going to be there for them no matter what. There isn't too much you can do about that isolation with where we're at right now with the virus. I mean, it has to be that way. That's understood. One of the things I wish fervently that we could get the president, the government to do is to ramp up testing and at least test healthcare workers first. That would let us know that, for one thing, we're not spreading it from patient to patient and to the public when we leave the facilities every day, that kind of thing. But, you know, I don't know that people recognize or would think of right away how hard it is for nurses and other healthcare workers to see that amount of death every day, every shift. It is more than heartbreaking. On that point you just made, you know, we have Governor Cuomo, President Trump, start speculating about reopening the economy and ending the lockdown. Well, just in the last few days, the death toll in New York State alone was over 700 a day. That's, on the average, one death every two minutes for the 24-hour period. It's staggering. So what are the nurses preparing here when the politicians start heeding the business community and saying, well, this is a price we're going to have to pay. We can't lock down the economy for a long time. Open up. What are the nurses preparing to do and say? Well, we're already, you know, I mentioned our actions. We do visual things, do we? But standing up outside of a hospital facilities, six feet apart, forming our own line, continuing to inform the public and hoping that they, with us, will insist to listen to the right information from medical experts and not economic advisors. I mean, this is just, there's going to be an awful lot of PTSD now and when this is over. It'll be the essential workers, not just healthcare workers. It will be the patient's families. It's very hard in our country. I mean, we all know that we don't really have a healthcare system. There's nobody been really concerned with it other than maybe the nurses, which is why we have pushed for Medicare for all for so long. This kind of illuminates exactly why we have needed something like that. And the the public is, even before the pandemic, was starting to understand that. Let me suggest a different venue for your uh, demonstrations. If you could demonstrate six feet apart in front of the White House with the proper signs and the nurses, in white, it would have a much greater effect nationally through the media. And it's all free speech, as long as you stay six feet apart. 20, 30 nurses can do this and do it again and again. There is nothing in front of the White House. 
In fact, no matter how terrible this president has been on many other issues, he probably has been picketed less than other prior presidents. <laughs> it's as if he's too terrible to deal with. So I, I would suggest that. Now, do you think after this COVID-19 relents that there's going to be a decisive push in public opinion and other healthcare working organizations for full Medicare for all, free choice of doctor, nurse, hospital, whatever, much more efficient, much more life-saving? Do you think it's going to change the equation here or it's just back to business as usual? I think the tendency in this country is always to go back to business as usual. It's easier, it's safer for whatever reason, but we won't stop pushing. And as I said, this is a great example. It shows people exactly why. For example, you cannot rely on being employed for your insurance. Everybody's not working now. Well, a large percentage of us aren't. So it's going to continue to take pressure but yes, I do see signs of that changing. We saw it even before the pandemic. Do you think that the example from Canada will start having more of an impact? I've always been amazed. I wrote an article, 25 Ways Life is Better in Canada, because mm -hmm. they have a full Medicare for All system. It's much more efficient. Right. It comes in at half price per capita, and they cover everyone. 30 million people are uncovered, another 50 underinsured. Anywhere, according to a Yale study that just came out recently, 65 to 105,000 people die every year because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time, on and on. Tell me, you're connected with the nurses in Canada. Why hasn't this country paid attention to it works in Canada? It's not theory. It's not some wild projection. It's been working since the late 1960s. Right. Well, of course, we do use them as one of the examples. We use several examples, in, including Canada. People do. They are starting to listen to that. They want a lot of what they've got. People who are dead set against anything like universal health, Medicare for all, will use anecdotes and old wives' tales about people dying there because they can't get surgery and that kind of thing. But I think what's telling is for people in any country that have what Canada has, that when that health system is threatened to be taken away or changed, like some of our multinational corporations are trying to do, they would just assume that all those countries with health plans like that have what we have, the people rise up and say, no, we haven't got to a point where we're close to having it. The closest we've got is Medicare. When Medicare gets threatened, people here step up and say, don't you dare. We have to get them to the point where they may be at that point now where they say we need this too. Well, one difference between Canada and the U.S. was in the 1960s, we were embroiled in the Vietnam War and they weren't. And the reason mm -hmm. why Lyndon Johnson didn't get Medicare for all in the 1963-64 period when Medicare and Medicaid were enacted was that the Congress said to him, this too much deficit the Vietnam War is costing us too much. You just have to do it for the elderly and under certain conditions for the poor. So once mm -hmm. again, the military machine devours its own people. And we're still inheriting that terrible mispriority that Canada didn't have to endure. What do you see in the next six, eight, ten weeks, Gene Ross? Well, we, of course, are going to continue to do our push. We'll raise holy hell if he decides economically to open the country and to do it as stupidly as he did the, the beginning of this where he didn't take control. I think you're going to see, unfortunately, unless and until we get the PPE that we need and want, we are going to see more and more healthcare workers struck down. And that will put the system that we have more at risk than it is now because it isn't just a statement. We, I think we can all see what will happen as we continue to get sick. You cannot afford to have us not working. Well, you get feedback from nurses all over the country, and I'm curious about why haven't the southern states that have their own big cities, Houston, Phoenix, Atlanta, Miami, come down with levels of severity that have affected New York, New Jersey, Detroit, some parts of Illinois. I know New Orleans has come down with it severely. But what's mm -hmm. going on? Do you think that they had a heads up and they locked down because 
it started in hot spots like New York and New Rochelle? You know, I'm not sure what he does with his friends versus the rest of us. But I will tell you that, you know, they keep talking about waves of the disease. Dr. Fauci keeps talking about that. So does Governor Cuomo. There will be, and they just might not be at that point. Florida nurses are very worried. They're extremely worried. I myself live in Minnesota. We, I think, locked down early enough that we are being able to handle what we've got here. But we're preparing for more. We're not planning on opening up soon. So it depends on where you are in the illness. But people that are very cavalier, that think because they're in a rural community, for example, they could be horribly hard hit. They are the places where these for-profit employers have closed hospitals. There will be fewer places for those patients to go, and their system will be overwhelmed very readily. Well, Scott Gottlieb, who was the former Food and Drug Administrator chief for uh, Trump, he, he was very close to the drug industry, and he's now out of government, just gave an interview saying that there's not going to be a vaccine for two years. And whether there be anything intermediate by way of lessening the severity of the COVID-19 affliction is still unknown. And there's a lot of quackery going on. You have the President of the United States recommending a dual drug that can damage the heart, has bad side effects, and there's no evidence that it affects COVID-19 patients. And then on the internet, crazy schemes and nostrums and wild assurances, a corporate crime wave. And the government is just not putting enough prosecutors on to make examples of these criminals. So we have such breakdowns coming. All the latent insecurities of our political economy and the plutocratic control of it, of the many by the few, are coming to the forefront here. And if there's a second wave in the fall and it affects the election, we have even more chaos. Who gives us reassurances here? Who can say that the supplies are now going to be adequate, that the hospital facilities are now going to be adequate? Can the military play a major role here? They warned Trump in September with a 100-page report that was just revealed that predicted almost exactly what happened with the COVID-19, and it was ignored by the White House. So where do you see the leadership, the reassurance? Well, <laughs> It's not real hopeful. I mean, you know, okay, you you mentioned Trump, not only is he not doing enough, he's actually sabotaging what should be done. Thus, our lobbying for the DPA, the Defense Production Act, being invoked. And as far as the equipment that we need, they keep talking about a shortage. We're not sure how short they are. They are doing battlefield triage, making nurses wear the wrong equipment or bring bandanas to work. And they say this is in order to save. Well, when an employer tells us to save, it's all economical. I know they want the public to think they're just trying to conserve supplies so there'll be enough for how long this thing lasts, but it's not. It's money, we know that, because we see the equipment in some of the hospitals, it's under lock and key, and they tell you you can't have it. The hand really doesn't know what the foot is doing. It's got to be Congress. I know the House is trying. They tried to get that temporary OSHA standard in one of the relief packages. They haven't been able to do it so far. But until you get someone to control that man and make him do what is needed to do for the health of the public, things aren't going to change. Well, we're talking with Gene Ross, the president of National Nurses United. You know, I've accused Congress of being AWOL. You know, that almost a month ago, they just went back home. No hearings, no committee meetings, no floor debate. And I said, well, they must not think they're essential service, that they're not essential workers, because within a few hundred yards of the Congress, there are all kinds of people on their front lines exposing themselves to peril and doing their duty and work. I think there needs to be high-profile congressional hearings. If you put your laser beam pressure nurses united on both the House and the Senate on this, they're coming back on April 20. Who knows for how long? I've never seen a situation like this. They're not on the job. No, they're not. You know, even our nurses have asked what we can do about Trump. And, and quite frankly, the man is ill. We know that. 
I honestly don't hold any hope of him doing what he needs to do other than maybe seeing him removed. But it's got to be the people who are enabling him who know better, the ones that aren't ill. They should be doing that. They should be doing their duty. And I am hoping, and certainly we would support investigations into exactly what's going on. We're looking right now at where the heck our equipment is. Well, I think the spotlight has got to be on Congress, but also, of course, greatly on Trump, who's using these daily news conferences to try to enhance his reelection and to take credit for everything and responsibility for nothing. He gives himself a 10 on a scale of 10, mm -hmm. the saying he has no responsibility for anything that's gone wrong. So in addition to the six feet apart demonstration in front of the White House, why don't you invite President Trump in full hazmat? <laughs> equipment to one of your hospitals to see exactly what you've been facing. Why don't you invite him? I mean, he's a draft dodger to be sure, but you know, he likes to, he likes to be in the spotlight. This will get him on the news like nothing else. Well, it certainly would make a good visual. I actually did hear one of the doctors on TV suggest that from New York last night. He needs to come down here when he spouts off and says, everything's under control. We're doing a great job. He needs to be on one of those units. How do people reach National Nurses United? Can you give their website? Yeah. If I were the public and were looking for information and help, I would go to nationalnursesunited.org or protectnurses.org. If I were a nurse, I would go to COVID at nationalnursesunited.org. Well, thank you very much, Jean Ross. We're entitled to be very proud of the millions of nurses all over the country who do work almost nobody would dare to do and don't get much publicity for it. I think if the nurses want to get more attention, they should learn how to put a, a ball in a hole in the ground like golfers and win the Masters, and then they'll get attention all over the world. There you go. Well, thank you for helping us get the word out. You're very welcome. We have been speaking with Jean Ross, president of National Nurses United. We will link to their work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now we're going to take a short break. When we return, we will talk to Dr. Bandy Lee, a forensic psychiatrist at Yale, who thinks the pathology of Donald Trump is a real threat to the public health. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your corporate crime report on Morning Minute for Friday, April 17, 2020. I'm Russell Mokhyber. In the years since the 2008 financial crisis, federal prosecutors in the United States have brought dozens of criminal cases against the world's most powerful banks, charging them with manipulating financial indices, helping their customers evade taxes, evading sanctions, and laundering money. To settle these cases, global banks like UBS, Barclays, HSBC, and BNP Paribas pay tens of billions of dollars in fines. They also agree to extensive reforms, hiring hundreds of compliance officers officers, spending billions on new systems, and installing independent monitors. In effect, the banks agreed to become worldwide enforcers of U.S. law, including financial sanctions. That's the take of University of Virginia law professor Pierre Verdier, author of the just-released book, Global Banks on Trial, U.S. Prosecutions, and the Remaking of International Finance. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. In response to state governors pushing back on his claim of absolute authority over when to reopen the country, Donald Trump tweeted out a reference to the film Mutiny on the Bounty, effectively comparing himself to the infamous Captain Bly, the volatile and paranoid captain of the bounty. He's calling himself this. Hmm. For the last three years, our next guest has been arguing that the mental health of our president mandates that he, too, should be set afloat in a dinghy. David? Dr. Bandy Lee is a forensic psychiatrist at Yale School of Medicine and an internationally recognized expert on violence. Dr. Lee is the president of the World Mental Health Coalition and has worked with various governments to implement violence prevention programs in prisons and the community. Dr. Lee edited the book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts assess a president. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Dr. Bandy Lee. Thank you very much for having me back. Well, you've made your point again and again with your colleagues from all over the country and the world that President Trump is unfit 
for his responsibilities of office, not just politically disagreeable, but that he has levels of instability, levels of confusion, unable to process information to make rational decisions, completely absorbed with his own ego, through which he interprets everything, scapegoating, attacking people who dare to criticize him, and using massive torrents of flattery for the people who are his significant. It's hard, you know, to visualize the captain of a ship careening wildly in turbulent waters called COVID-19, having delayed for weeks by ridiculing this peril in a variety of ways, which he now denies, and increased certainly the level of deaths and afflictions as a result before any measures start being put in order. Now, there is a convention in your profession that you don't make a judgment about someone's mental health unless you're sitting there examining the person. And you have raised this issue with your profession, and you have responded to it. Tell yes, us. Yes, that's right. Well, I think it has shown itself to be critical. The fact is not so much, the important fact is not that that convention prohibits diagnosing public figures. Actually, we would have no need to. They're not our patients. We wouldn't examine them. So there's nothing left to be confidential about. But what was truly alarming to me, and I think egregious on the part of the American Psychiatric Association, for whatever reason they did it, at the onset of the Trump presidency, changed the rule to cover not just diagnosis, but any comment of any kind on a public figure under any circumstance. Now, that blatantly goes against our First Amendment rights because a public figure is not a patient. It's not covered by professional responsibility. Our professional responsibility is to society. In fact, that very rule, which is only one rule in one voluntary association, none of the other associations around the world that we know of has this rule, and no licensing board can adopt it because it goes against the First Amendment. But the fact that they prevented our ability to warn society in the case of dangers, stating this rule, when it's not in, in fact even a rule, it's a guideline, the guideline actually states this. We don't just have a responsibility to patients. We have it as well to society. And so psychiatrists are expected to participate in activities that improve the community and promote public health. That is why that restriction is in there. So in the context of the public asking us about a public figure, we're encouraged to educate the public, just not diagnose. And by amplifying the diagnosis, and eliminating the fact that we ought to educate the public or protect public health is really turning medical ethics upside down. And that is what happened at the onset of the presidency. And I think that needs to be clarified that an association that not even all psychiatrists belong to has been engaging in this misinformation campaign because it was really a public campaign and intimidation of mental health experts when they would wish to speak. How about the American Psychological Association? Where do they stand on uh, that? That's very interesting because when the American Psychiatric Association came out with this announcement of what they called a reaffirmed rule, but it's actually a new rule, the American Psychological Association said, we have a similar rule ourselves. Of course, they don't, and they later retracted that statement, but that's what happened. Well, you have the 25th Amendment. It's the Constitution, which really sets yes. the stage for your kind of professional judgment. And the 25th Amendment says, if the vice president of the United States notices erratic behavior, unstable behavior, whether psychological or physical debility, the vice president can put in motion with other cabinet members a initiative to suspend the president from his or her office. Now, if they were to do that, they would have to resort to the kind of empirical evidence and professional judgment that you are putting forward, would they not? Exactly, exactly. In fact, I have had a number of 
conversations with the drafter of the 25th Amendment because we've been invited to a number of conferences to speak together. And he has lamented the fact that the 25th Amendment, because it is a political process and because it is political, I don't have a role in deciding whether or not the 25th Amendment happens, but it could not happen and would not be sensitive enough to happen in many psychiatric circumstances where it ought to be initiated by the input of mental health experts such as myself. And that is something that I find truly problematic and even exceptional in all legal cases. As a forensic psychiatrist, I'm often called to testify as an expert witness. And in court, in numerous legal cases, in policy decisions, they would not make a decision without expert input. I mean, the fact that you admit evidence into court and expert opinion is considered when it's done in the standardized way with scientific backing of it. It is considered evidence. In fact, it's part of the facts that you gather. And therefore, for a political process to say, for for political people to say that a political process should not engage with anybody else other than politicians is quite a divergence from usual legal practice. They couldn't engage it without evidence. They'd have to produce evidence of the kind that you are bringing together. That's right. Well, you know, it's quite interesting. A president should tell the truth to the people. A president that has 17,000 fabrications and lies since he was inaugurated, he is a pathological liar. He is a savage sexual predator. He misleads his supporters and endangers them. He urges them to do things that are not good for them, like taking certain unproven drugs for the COVID-19. He contradicts scientists with his political attempt to embellish his own ego and his own achievements in preparation for the next election. Now, to me, an impeachable offense is sufficient with a pathological liar. How can you have a president that every day, sometimes every hour, tweets out fabrications, things that aren't so, things that didn't happen, things that he thought happened that didn't happen, things that he did that he didn't do in terms of taking credit. So it's really a very easy case on many, many grounds. And are you getting any support from other professions like medical societies, nurses organizations, who have to deal with similar phenomena and have similar professional duties, not just to individuate themselves with personal clients, but a professional commitment to the society at large. That's one of the definitions of a profession. Yes. In fact, now that he is increasing the unnecessary deaths from the viral pandemic, not just in the hundreds of thousands, but possibly in the millions around the world as he pulls funding from the World Health Organization. I mean, the one instrument we have for bringing about global coordination for confronting this crisis, there couldn't be a greater medical immediate emergency as we have now, all because of the psychological problems of this president, as well as his criminal intent. But we have this situation here, and so there's no question among medical professionals. There's a group of non-psychiatric physicians who are now backing us and collecting their voices. Of course, among mental health professionals, it has always been a consensus, apart from just a handful of outliers. And yet, our media in this country talk about the deadliness from denying expertise that the media have engaged in, starting with the New York Times editorial board actually collaborated with the American Psychiatric Association in January of 2018 to put out a very explicit statement that the public does not need to hear from psychiatrists about the president's mental health, that they should not speak and that their opinion is not wanted. I mean, what kind of newspaper does that? But of course, that was the explicit voice of not just the American Psychiatric Association, but a very pharmaceutical industry supported past APA president, who was the only full page opinion that the Times has ever 
printed on this issue, who said the president is just a jerk. And so to this day, the members of the public come to us and say, why aren't mental health professionals speaking up more? And why, when the only psychiatrist they hear of is someone who says that the president is just a jerk, when even for them it is so blatant, that the president is suffering from severe symptoms. And as you say, the level of lying alone is pathological. We're talking with Dr. Bandy Lee of Yale School of Medicine. The New York Times, Bandy, has published hundreds of articles about the incompetence of Trump, the ignorance of Trump, the incapacity to govern of Trump, the petty, vengeful nature of Trump, the nepotism of Trump, the chronic line of Trump. So if they don't want to use your language, your psychiatric or psychological language, what is it about them that they don't go to the conclusion of their own reporter's documentation and say he's unfit for office? He's totally incompetent, and he creates a fantasy about himself and separates people who believe him from reality in their daily lives, and he should resign. He should obviously have been impeached if the House of Representatives took proposals from constitutional law specialists. They could have been impeached on 12 grounds. But yeah. apart from that, there should be a mass demand for his removal, for his resignation. Oh, he'll never resign. Well, that's not the burden of those who demand his resignation. That's their duty. And they used to say Nixon would never resign. He's stubborn. You have to take him out feet first. Well, he did resign. And it's appalling to see this marvelous documentation by newspapers and other media day by day of the wreckage that he is leaving the country embroiled in and aiding and abetting actually worsening trends. Like he wanted to cut the budgets of key health agencies in this country that dealt with infectious disease. And he closed down the office in the White House, headed by a rear admiral, to prepare for a potential pandemic in 2018. It's not that he's just doing nothing at moments of peril and not just COVID-19. It's that he's actively aiding and abetting the devastation that. of the health and safety of the American people, whether it's cutting back OSHA, whether it's destroying EPA, whether it's freezing the activity of the auto safety agency whether it's wanting to get rid of Obamacare without any replacement and expose 20 more million people to life without health insurance, which includes a consequence of mortality and morbidity as a result. So what's the New York Times problem here? If they don't want to use your language, they have ample evidence in their pages. Well, you have just outlined a great summary of the multiple ways in which he has been destructive to the country and if not to the world. And this destructiveness, if it were purely criminal, purely intentional, that is, then it would go only so far. But the reason why it is critical to distinguish what is pathological versus normal and healthy and ordinarily life-affirming is that it actually ends up being far more efficient. And people marvel at the fact that He's such a Teflon president or that he is able to whip up a following in ways that no one ever has managed to. Well, this is actually a symptom of pathology. And the reason why it's so important to distinguish is exactly for the, the factors you outlined, that he ends up being almost exclusively destructive and never productive because pathology is so efficient. It brings about damage and death. And it is far more effective than anything we can consciously, rationally plan. And that's also what's happening in addition to the criminal in intent. And so why is the New York Times avoiding our language? I mean, it set the stage. The media were not always like this. In fact, I was interviewing 15 hours a day, every single day, soon after the publication of our book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, which was an unprecedented near instant New York Times bestseller. Well, they avoided reviewing it. They avoided mentioning it. And eventually, when our voices were getting so loud that our topic became the number one issue of the national news, all the programs were airing us, all the major network cable primetime programs 
had or were mentioning us on air. And that is when the New York Times stepped in. Why did they do so? I couldn't really speak for their intentions, but I could speak for the results of their actions. Did they ever uh, explain? Did they ever have an intelligent exchange of views as to, to explain uh, their position? No, no. I, I mean, even the reporters who quoted me as central to their articles had only my quotes taken out. All the political pundits would be left in, and they themselves have been puzzled. It's happened over and over, not just with the New York Times now, but with multiple, certainly the most prominent media. And I had been invited to news programs and other major programs over 50 times just for CNN, and none of them were none of them were actually aired except for one. They would all get canceled at the top. So producers would constantly be inviting us, and editors and reporters would constantly be interviewing us, but it would never get printed. And after two and a half years, almost two and a half years of this, we finally realized that not by chance. And my guess is that if you exclude expert voices who can show you the standardized means by which we come to our conclusions, they're not just personal opinions, they are professionally standardized conclusions that we come to a consensus about once we have enough information. And most experts will tell you we have more information about Donald Trump than any patient that we've ever treated. It was even laughed about at a major conference at Harvard. And so when we have this much information and this much confirmation, and the president has not met one criterion of basic mental capacity, that is the fundamental building block of fitness. And so if you don't have that, if you don't have rationality and sanity, you can't have any other kind of fitness. Me, and he me. did not meet one criterion. And we had great information for that report, which came from the Mueller report. Let me propose to you a question probably you've never been asked about the bizarre nature of what it takes to demand a president to resign. So let's say, hypothetically, Donald Trump had a national news conference tomorrow, and he said, to my tens of millions of supporters, you've supported me because I say publicly what you think privately. And I am going to say the following. And he launches into the most ugly, bigoted stereotypes against Hispanics, against blacks, against Asian Americans, against Jews, against Arabs, against gays. And then he said, take that. My guess is the New York Times would immediately demand his resignation. Because words are more explosive than devastating deeds in American politics. Mm. What's your view? First of all, I'm not sure the New York Times will make a demand, even in that state, partly because I have been hearing about the conflicts of interest that some reporters have. And well, apparently... let's not get mired in that right now. The media would demand his resignation. The public would demand his resignation. You see it all the time. Terrible politicians, terrible record for four or five years, stiffing workers, stiffing consumers. Then they stumble on some bigoted words and they're told to get out. Oh, I see. Well, because as you said, the president is speaking other people's minds. And wouldn't that, in pure political terms, be something that is acceptable? So I guess my argument still is going in the direction of they're not demanding his resignation. But what would what would allow for the kind of turnaround among his base or his followers that would allow for a demand for resignation to be possible is actually psychological, not based on words or objective words or deeds. And that is if the president were to say, I made a mistake, this warrants resignation, then that is the point where his followers will turn around and agree with him, a large portion of them. Not the widespread deaths from COVID-19 and not the loss of family members and friends, but the president either saying so himself or being forced to resign, the resignation itself or the impeachment itself, I have said over and over, 
justifies impeachment in the minds of his followers. And that is because their psychology is at a level, oftentimes I should note that people are drawn to the president because of similar psychology to start with, but others are healthy and sound to begin with. But because of the length of time that a severely symptomatic president has been kept in power in a position of influence with lots of exposure through the media and social media and rallies, there's also been a transmission of symptoms. Mental symptoms can be transmitted. And so you end up with a base that is very much psychologically similar to the president. And this psychology, unlike most people's impression, is actually submissive psychology. And Donald Trump, he has to maintain a posturing of being dominant and powerful and strong. But we have seen in multiple situations under the influence of Vladimir Putin or Kim Jong-un, he quickly comes to a state of submissiveness. And that means that once someone is removed from a position of power or he admits to a mistake, in other words, shows that he is fallible, then the unconditional worshipping of that person ceases. And it's actually a very binary, simplistic dynamic where they either idealize him as perfect, like a king, like a god, with total authority over all situations, or he is too weak, too fallible, too human to be worth following. Well, you know, he's never admitted a mistake. He's never admitted doing anything wrong. His phrase is, I have not done anything wrong. He said under Article 2, I can do anything I want as president. Those were his very words. So what you're really arguing was anticipated by our founding fathers. Number one, the last thing they wanted to tolerate was a monarchical executive, another King George that violated accountability, which is why they set up the separation of powers between the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. And what you're arguing falls right into a major category of what they thought was an impeachable offense in the Federalist Papers, which was, quote, an abuse of public trust, end quote, an abuse of public Mm -hmm. trust. That was written by Alexander Hamilton, among others, who believed in a strong president. So it's not like, you know, you're on the margins of professional expression here. You can document it in a whole variety of secular ways, historical, contemporary, functional, you name it. Well, we're out of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. It's to be continued. I hope so. Thank you very much. We've been speaking with Dr. Bandy Lee about Donald Trump's mishandling of the coronavirus crisis and other things. We will link to her work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. So we have time. Let's do a listener question, David. This one comes to us from Paul D. Marshall. Ralph, on a lighter side, how do I purchase the Nader Family Cookbooks, the Ralph Nader and Family Cookbook, classic recipes from Lebanon and beyond, and in the kitchen, recipes for food and thought? Thank you. Great show. I'm a regular listener. Hope you all stay well. Thank you, Paul. Well, it's it's a great cookbook. I don't say that for myself. They're mostly my mother's recipes, and and we grew up on them. Very nutritious, delicious, low in fat, sugar, salt. But it's more than a cookbook. I write a long introduction of what food around the table meant in terms of raising us and having conversations and training us not to whine about the food and to understand nutrition, and not to be susceptible to sweetened food and additives. You can get the book from any bookstore, but the bookstores are closed. So you'll have to get it online. You know where you can get books online. Powell's is one, Barnes & Noble is another, the dreaded Amazon is a third. And if you want to have bulk copies, you can go to the publisher. It's a beautiful hardback book with all kinds of beautiful photography of the various dishes. And the publisher is Akasic Books. That's A-K-A-S-H-I-C Books. You can reach them at akasicbooks.com. Thank you very much, Paul. You know, more and more people, because they're quarantining, sheltering in place, are cooking. And I can't tell you the number of people who have discovered their kitchen and are eating healthy. 
And in a sense, by encouraging more nutritious diets and less fat, sugar, salt diets, junk food diets, you're improving your resistance to any kind of affliction. Healthier people have a better chance. Ralph, your mom taught you a lot of things. Did she teach you to cook? Yeah, we, we had to help around the kitchen. There were certain things like elaborate desserts that she learned years ago and required very depth handling that we weren't involved in doing. But, you know, making hummus, different kinds of soups, appetizers, salads, burhul with garlic and onions, lentil soup, all kinds of legumes. Yeah. yeah we. Would you consider yourself a, a decent cook? He was a cook in the army. They, they, they brought him, weren't you a cook in the <laughs> that's, army? That's I really said cooking. I said decent cook. <laughs> yeah, that's really cooking for volume, David. I once was involved in an effort of making banana bread for 24,000 soldiers. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, that's a lot know, of bananas. Yeah. This is it's simple cooking. That's the great thing. These recipes are simple to follow. You can use your own judgment and vary it. And they involve ingredients that are available, with few exceptions, in all the grocery stores. And they're less expensive than heavy cuts of meat and pork. All right. Very good. Thank you for your questions. Keep them coming on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website. I want to thank our guests again, Nurse Jean Ross and Dr. Bandy Lee. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up. A transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. And Ralph has got three books out, The Fable, How the Rats Reformed the Congress. To acquire a copy of that, go to ratsreformcongress.org. Fake President, Decoding Trump's Gaslighting, Corruption, and General BS, co-written with Mark Green. And the Ralph Nader and Family Cookbook, Classic Recipes from Lebanon and Beyond. We will link to that also. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our intern is Michaela Squire. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we welcome back one of the foremost experts in infectious disease, Dr. Michael Osterholm. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. And it's more important than ever for citizens to be all over Congress. We're going to try to have a resurgence here, learn from the defenseless posture of our country in the COVID-19 and get some real changes. And it's all about Congress. And that's why I wrote this book. Just go to ratsreformcongress.org. Hi, this is Jimmy Lee Word, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up. First, Steve has an additional question for Gene Ross. Well, before we close, Gene Ross, I want to have David and Steve weigh in here. I'm sure they've got some insightful questions or comments. Yeah, Gene, these doctors and nurses, healthcare workers who have been threatened with firing and some have been fired, the rationale by the hospital management is that they're not authorized to speak on behalf of the institution and that they're trying to protect patient and staff confidentiality. What would you say to that? That's a ruse. <laughs> That's a red herring. We are entrusted with the public health. We're not giving out any specific names, very often not even where we work, but it's our duty to speak out. That's what we do. We advocate for patients. The public needs to know. They need to know if there are enough trained workers, including RNs, in that hospital. They need to know that they're trained, that there is a plan. They need to know that they're protected with the right equipment. And they need to know that that hospital won't stint on the same equipment. And so the fact that they claim HIPAA all the time, it's just a ruse. HIPAA being, just clarify that for our listeners. It's the law that says we have to keep patients' privacy utmost. You cannot give out their name, what they've got, what kind of illness, et cetera, which we would never do anyway. It doesn't serve the purpose of the information we're trying to get out anyway. And now Ralph asked David and Steve to weigh in on his interview of Dr. Lee. David, Steve. What do you think? Do you have any doubt that the media would not demand and the Congress would not demand his resignation 
if he attacked with vile, bigoted, stereotypical language those five constituencies that I mentioned? Just to show the power of words over deeds, that you can do the most dastardly deeds, violating the law, killing innocents abroad and wars of aggression, unconstitutional, illegal, no problem. But if you say some bigoted thing, then the media and everybody else goes after you who is offended. What's your point? Well, they report what people say, not what they do. So it only stands to reason that they would be offended by what you say, not what you do. And what you do and you know what's being done is often being done under cover of darkness or you know it's a more complicated kind of thing and harder to parse but a word a volatile word a provocative word is just more viscerally powerful yeah i mean all the things that he does are lies he doesn't tell us where it comes from or exactly why he's doing it but a bigoted statement is not a is not a lie it's a truth one of his presidential assistants who since left office omarosa wrote a book where she said there are tapes that have yet to be disclosed before Trump became president, recording his most vile, biased, bigoted statements against various ethnic groups. And you can see, once again, he succeeded in keeping these tapes from being made public. Hasn't he said those words already when he called Mexicans rapists and murderers and called people from Africa coming from S-hole countries. Has he already not said those things? He's come close. Those are, are not the traditional racist and bigoted phrases oh, that have been okay. used over the years, the same ones and same ones. He got into trouble for that. It's really quite amazing. He actually got into greater trouble for those two comments than he has for destroying whole health and safety agencies allowing coal ash to infect the lungs of asthmatic children by saying clean, beautiful coal, cut back on the pollution controls. So we've got to face up to this triumph of words over deeds in terms of accountability. And also recognize that words do kill, in fact, kill very widely, and that the words are not just words. In fact, yeah, every they time provoke, speak, they provoke, and they provoke violent deeds. If I just may say one thing, that the silencing of mental health professionals has worked to silence those very persons who are among the citizenry who are most qualified to detect would-be tyrants. And therefore, we have an essential role to supporting the Constitution and the purpose of the Constitution. Well, you know, Donald Trump attacks his critics. Has he ever attacked you and your constituents? He has not, but the White House has continually asked reporters to interview, in addition to me, a certain Dr. Gina Loudon, who did some kind of online doctorate that has nothing to do with psychology. But they are quite disturbed that no mental health expert who has any respectability, would speak for the president instead of against him. Interesting. With his thousands of tweets, he has very carefully avoided tweeting against articles that have come from your professional colleagues and yourself. That ought to and tell yes, you something. That ought to tell you something. He has projected a lot. He has projected his own cognitive deficits onto Joe Biden whatever he has said, a mental derangement against Nancy Pelosi and Adam Schiff. So when someone describes others in these mental health terms, it's usually a sign to look out for mental health problems in the person making the description. Well, for sure, in Trump's case, he calls Bernie Sanders crazy Bernie. I mean, he uses all kinds of psychiatric epithets, <laughs> which uh, remind people of how applicable they are to his erratic behavior. Dr. Lee, the last time you spoke to us, it was around impeachment time, and Donald Trump was under a tremendous amount of pressure there, and we talked about what he possibly could or couldn't do. What has this crisis laid bare about his pathology, this coronavirus epidemic, pandemic crisis? Is it up the ante, and what's he revealing in his daily briefings? 
Well, I mean, what he's revealing, what is happening is because of the situation, the suffering and death are vastly increased. But the psychology is exactly the same. What we warned against was exactly the same, that he would make perilous situations worse, as he did with northern Syria and then with assassination of an Iranian general. Those were specific incidents we warned against a matter of days before they actually happened. We wrote to Congress about warning that something was going to happen. And when coronavirus was first being announced, I have written articles stating that if we don't deal with the president's mental health, this deadly pandemic will be made far worse. And I said this through February and March. And when the reports came out, of course, we found out he made it as worse as possible. So it's the exact same prediction and same outcome as we would expect from his psychological makeup. And it seems from these daily briefings, his supporters, you know, behind the scenes are recognizing this and they've been trying to discourage him from going out there and taking yes, center Yes, I mean, his, his mental pathology is just laid out there for people to see, but he's not out there to convince those who can see this. He's out there to keep his base attached to him, to keep his base loyal to him because they are already in a pathological mindset where they can no longer see reality for what it is. Is right. he capable of being terrified and knowing that he's messing up? Oh, yes. Up? He's constantly terrified. I mean, Does that's he know why he's, he's terrified? So... Does he know he's terrified? Well, he thinks everyone is terrified and that this is the only way people operate. Just like Captain Bly, who believed that cruelty was very effective because fear is the only way you can keep the seamen in line. He's, he was talking about his own, his own worldview coming from his own mentality. It's almost like he's saying, he's screaming, I'm crazy. Somebody do something about me. I'm telling you. Oh, yes. I mean, for loud. mental health professionals, this is a cry for help. I mean, he is screaming to... He's saying, I'm him. Captain Bly. <laughs> Stop me. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you, exactly. Doctor. Appreciate that. And that's a wrap. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Until next time. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting great.